Does this work? It does. How long do you want to be here? I, I, I don't mean you personally. I mean you and me, we as representatives of Homo sapiens. I want to step back and take a broader picture of education in the global sense, and really the global, even the cosmic sense. In 18 minutes, of course, we're not going to answer that question, but what I want to try and do is convince you that it's possible to begin to make a plan to answer that question. In a cosmic sense, how long can we be here? So the answer is education. It's existential education. And, and education, of course, is transgenerational information transfer, right? I mean, that's, that's, this educate, that's this existential concept for what it really is. It's the ability to take information um, and skills from, from one, one time to the next time over times longer than our lifetime. Um, I think that the long-term existence of our species depends on education, and I want to try and make that point um, more clear as we go into this. Uh, the output or a consequence of existential education is vast amounts of information, and there's a, there's a, a universal biomarker for civilization that follows from this concept of existential education. Education is about perspective, right? Where are we? Where exactly are we in the history of the universe? Well, just a, um, a brief history. 14 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang, um, a, a cosmic event which propelled us towards five billion years later, the, um, or five billion years ago, the formation of the solar system. Uh, the sun was fainter at that time. The big event for us was 3.8 billion years ago, we, we found evidence of life. Those were those single-celled creatures um, that were called cyanobacteria. Not too much later, jellyfish appeared, but um, about uh, within the last 500 million years, we, we developed complex life, trilobites and things that happen really in a, in a blink of time compared to the history of the universe. If we expand that last half, half a billion years, um, the sequence from complex life to dinosaurs took about 250 million years. And then our age, the age of mammals, happened um, in the last 65 million years. Two-legged creatures walking like we did didn't happen until really another blink of the eye. We have to expand that line even further. So hominids appeared about four million years ago. Our direct ancestors, not until 120,000 years ago. And then civilization as we know it is still another expansion. It's just the width of that line right there. So we're really a very tiny part of the universe. Well, to answer this big question, how long will we, we be here, there are things that we have to overcome. One of the, the big ones is ourselves, right? So starting half a century ago, a group of scientists um, began publishing something called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which actually has a rather pessimistic view of whether we're likely to survive ourselves and our technological misdeeds. They started 50 years ago arguing that nuclear holocaust would be the end of us. Um, now they talk about man-made global warming. I'm, I'm an optimist. I think we can get over that. But the downside of getting over that is that we have to fight even longer odds to survive. If you look at the history of, of the last 500 million years, it's really history of death and destruction and extinction. I mean, the, the event that we, many of you know about is, is the event that, that wiped out the dinosaurs 60 million years ago. During that event, which was probably a comet or an asteroid that collided with the Earth, 75% of all species were extincted. But that wasn't the big one. The big one was, was 240 million years ago. There's an event that we don't understand that wiped out 95% of all species. So this is a plot that shows, over time, the fraction of species that are extincted. And you can see that the history of the Earth has really been one of extinction. There's never been a period of time when, when life has not been recycling itself and reforming. Now you might say, well, we're special. We're hominids, we're walking on two feet, we're somehow smarter than everything else and we're going to survive. But the history of the hominids isn't any better. Here, here's, here's Homo sapiens right here. Compared to, uh, compared to the Neanderthals, which we competed with, over thousands of years, they, they survived much longer than we have. 
And in fact, all of our hominid ancestors lived for just about a million years, and not much longer than that. So it's even worse when we start to talk about civilization, right? As a species, we create civilizations. The Chinese, um, over a thousand years ago, used to look at the sun near the horizon and they could see sunspots. And there was a period of time called the medieval warm period when there were many, many, many sunspots according to the Chinese records. We didn't have them in Western records. We know from modern research studies of the sun that when there are lots of sunspots, par paradoxically, the sun is warmer. The sun is warmer, it means the earth is warmer. And that was a period of time when in the Southwest, there were cultures that had been around for hundreds of years, the Mogollon, the Anasazi, the Hohokam, they were Pueblo cultures. They vanished. As far as we know, they vanished because of, of many decades of the dry climate. The converse to that was the, the Vikings cultivated the western coast of Greenland, um, and their, their uh, settlements lasted for hundreds of years. But during a, the transition from this period of many sunspots to few sunspots that we call the Little Ice Age, the temperatures on the earth, the average temperatures on the earth got cooler. And the growings of the Vikings were actually agrarian. This, this civilization that had thousands of people was wiped out because it got too cold. So climate is a huge variable, not just because of what we do, but because it changes naturally. And it's been the, it's been the cause for civilizations to come and go. It's a little bit embarrassing to ask what is the most successful life form on the earth? But it's these guys, cyanobacteria. By any yardstick that you want to use, they're much more successful than we are, and they date back 3.8 billion years. Measure the total biomass, the number of generations, just about anything, except maybe for brain cells. But in terms of, in terms of their survivability, they, they have lasted longer than anything, even the jellyfish. So the answer has to be, are we special? Are we special enough so that we will have some sort of long-term survival prospects? It's the interesting question. And of course, throughout the history of science, we've always argued that we are special. We're the center of the solar system, not we're the third rock out. The solar system is the center of the galaxy, not we're, we're way out here. We're out in the suburbs. We used to say that that the sun is, is unique because there aren't, there aren't planets around other stars. Well, just in your lifetime, over the last 20 years, we've discovered that that's far from being true. In fact, if you look up in the sky, there are more planets than there are stars. And 25% of those planets have water and are probably Earth-like. That's a staggering conclusion, and it makes us realize that we're not at all special. Except maybe we are compared to everything else on Earth. And that's our ability to use education, existential, existential education. This is all about information. This thing right here, that's DNA. And nature has been educating us for 3.8 billion years. Remember, existential education is the transfer of survival information from one generation to the next. That's what DNA does. And it started out on the surface of the Earth with those cyanobacteria, and the alphabet of information in their DNA had about 100,000 characters. The alphabet of information that's built into us over here, so this is a timeline. There's 3.8 billion years, here we are. Do you know how long our DNA is? Well, if you stretched it out in a line, it would be two meters long, and it would have roughly 100 billion characters of information in it. And the really cool thing, which has been argued only recently, is if the time that it takes to double the amount of information in the DNA of all of these species is about 200 million years. If you run this line backwards to when there's only one bit of information, you know how long ago it was? 10 billion years ago. That's a, that's a, remarkable, a more remarkable fact that nobody knows how to interpret right now. But if you look over the last 30, 40 years of our technology, we're doing the same thing, but we're not doing it with DNA. It's still about information, and it's about existential education. If you take all of the info, so these three point, these, these points right here represent time from 1950 to um, 
close to where we are now in time. Each one of those points was constructed by adding up all the information that we know is stored digitally on the world. So right now, if we add up all of our CDs and cell phone information and computer information, what the IRS has on us, everything, it turns out that there's one followed by about 21 zeros of information. But more remarkably, that information is doubling every three years. Instead of the biological information every 200 million years, our information is doubling every three years. And in fact, if you follow it back to when there wasn't very much information, you go back to the 1700s or something like that. Of course, there was more information in books before that. But the trend, we call this an exponential trend, goes over many generations and doesn't show signs of stopping. That amount of information is staggering because about 10% of global electricity production goes into manipulating, storing, and analyzing that data. 10% of all the power we create. Imagine that we could look out into space to all of these Earth-like planets and find evidence of another civilization, like ours. Would that change our way of thinking about our, su our survivability? It probably would. Imagine we look out in space and we don't see any evidence of any other civilization, but we have a machine that we think is sensitive enough to see civilization like what we have, Earth-like civilization, with technology and with information. That would probably also change our way of thinking about our survivability, maybe change our ways. Well, about two years ago, um, a group privately funded um, got together a bunch of scientists and engineers and asked the question, could we build a machine that could see evidence of civilization? It relies on finding a biomarker that's visible from a great distance that is evidence of civilization. And the answer is there is a really good biomarker, and you've heard about it. It's called global warming. All of this energy that we use on our planet eventually ends up as what? Heat. That's the first law of thermodynamics. That's the unavoid unavoidable global warming problem that we face. All of the power we use turns into heat. And eventually, in a civilization which is well-educated and pr producing lots of information, just manipulating the information is an enormous amount of heat. Well, this is kind of a complicated plot, but what it shows for an astronomer is our ability to detect this signal. And our ability to detect this signal is the amount of heat that we're producing compared to the amount of heat that the Earth is absorbing from the sun. And that ratio is a number we called omega. And I've just plotted on here some numbers corresponding to different power usage. And so if we used all of the energy that the sun provides us, our omega would be one. And we could heat the planet with the waste energy of using all of that heat. In fact, our present global power production is right here. And we are producing, <clears throat> excuse me, by nuclear and coal and other means, about five hundredths of a percent of all the power that strikes the Earth from the sun. That's a remarkable number. To me, it was shockingly large. Because all of that energy goes into heat that has to heat the planet. If you go back to the Roman periods, add up all the campfires and the biological heat production, humankind at that time was producing one ten millionth of the total power that heats the planet from the sun. Plants right now, if you add up the power that they absorb, are producing a few tenths of a percent of the total power that strikes the Earth from the sun. So this is, this is our biomarker, to look for heat around other planets near to the sun. I don't have much time to talk about all of the, some really cool technology that goes into this, but this group of scientists and engineers got together and concluded that Yes, it was possible to look to a distance of about 60 light years from the Earth where there will be hundreds of stars and the likelihood of being able to see a civilization that's not too much more advanced than the Earth, but in principle we should be able to see maybe 20 or 30 Earth-like civilizations if we're not so special. Well, so the bottom line to this is Education may be, in fact, our savior. It may produce vast amounts of information. That information 
is associated with heat. We have the capability of building an instrument now for less than the cost of a couple of Boeing 777s, much less than the cost of a B-1 bomber, a telescope that's actually smaller than a football field that can tell us whether or not civilization is something which is rare and infrequent and incredibly delicate, or whether our education, the things we're talking about today, our ability to take survival skills and information and move it from one generation to the next is going to be the secret to staying around for more than a few 10,000 years. Thanks. <laughs>